That is not a woman who takes shit from men, I can tell you that straight up. Hello and welcome back to my channel, or hi, if you're new, my name is Emma, complete grad, film student, and this is part two of the book haul that I did on Tuesday, and I'm gonna continue now. Let's just pick up where we left off. Let's do the thing that I didn't realise was a book because I thought it was just a movie, which is quite embarrassing, especially if it's me doing it anyway. I bought Virginia Woolf Orlando. I have read a little bit of Virginia Woolf. I read, um, I highly recommend A Room of One's Own. Absolutely, it's an essay. It's not even 100 pages, is it? No, it's 100 pages. Like, I really, really recommend this. Women. <laughs> Deserve the space they take up. What a shock. A revolution, which most of us forget. So if you haven't seen the film Orlando, I highly recommend it. It's an adaptation by Sally Porter. So good. It's so fucking good with Tilda Swinton. It's so, so good. I didn't fucking realize it was a book. <laughs> I didn't realise until I was scrolling through Goodreads and one of you like said that you'd read it and I saw it and I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm dumb. So obviously I bought it straight away. Also look how pretty this edition is. Ugh, amazing, impeccable, fantastic. Am I now annoyed that I've just realised but I also have other Virginia Woolf in different editions? To be fair, it's not my copy of Mrs. Dalloway. It's my mother's copy of Mrs. Dalloway. That I stole off her that I haven't read, actually, <laughs> that I'm using for decoration purposes. Maybe I'll buy another one in this edition and um, give this back to her. Maybe. I've got it on indefinite loan. My friends had to study them. Um, for English Lit, they had to do um, To the Lighthouse. So I know a lot of people don't have the best relationship with Virginia Woolf. It's not mine. God, I hate when he does that. My brother has a bad habit of putting his books on my bookshelf, which is not okay. This isn't a this isn't a collaborative project. <laughs> this is a possessive project. Apps of fuck. It's my library. You can fuck off. I bought this because I really enjoyed the book, film, and I actually haven't read that much of her fiction. Um, I know I've read like extracts and stuff, but I just want more. We need to expand. This is like an ongoing thing. Um, expand this? What am I expanding? My brain. The point of this is that Orlando doesn't age and then at one point randomly switches his gender, which in the film goes completely unacknowledged, apart from like one shot of her looking at herself in the mirror like, yep, <laughs> it's just not explained either. While I kind of wanted explanation and backstory. I think the film it almost works better, the story almost works better that you have no idea what the fuck is going on. Kind of in a way that Watermelon Sugar works, where you're given the parameters of your reality and because it's kind of done the entire fucking way through like that, um, you can just keep rolling with it. One thing they tell us at school is like, with film, is like once you, if you set the rules of your world really early on and you can do whatever the fuck you want and no one's going to question it. If you start to change things halfway through everyone's going to be like, whoa, what the fuck? So if you establish rules to a world that is different from our own early on, you can get away with it. And that's kind of what this does, right? A fancy, impossible but delicious and exuberance of life and wit. <laughs> the TLC. Times Literary Supplement. <laughs> it does speak that culture. Written for Virginia Woolf's intimate friend, the charismatic bisexual writer Vita Sackville-West. Great name. Orlando is a playful mock biography of a chameleon. My mother will say chameleon, it's the funniest thing ever. Chameleon-like historical figure who changes sex and identity at, wi at will? Okay. First masculine, then feminine, Orlando begins life as a young 16th century nobleman, then gallops through the centuries to end up as a woman writer in Virginia Woolf's own time. The book takes it to the 19... Film takes to the 1990s. A wry commentary on gender roles and modes of history, Orlando is also, in Virginia Woolf's own words, a light-hearted writer's holiday, which delights in its ambiguity and capriciousness. I am excited, I am excited. And also I think this fits very much with, so, me and a friend of mine have this thing of <laughs> pretentious thing I'm reading on the tube to appear really mysterious. It's going really well. I believe she was reading Sartre last time I checked and the time before that she was reading Virginia Woolf. I sent her, you know, pictures of me on the tube reading um, Things Fall Apart and also when I was reading Sun Tzu's Art of War. I was like, huh, look at me. 
amazing. It's at the moment the little things that are fueling our egos because we have nothing else to go on because it's still a lockdown. But yeah, I'm just excited to have more. <gasps> oh my god. It has pictures. There are definitely more. I saw more. Oh. Oh, <gasps> oh how exciting. Oh. Exciting. I got so <laughs> I got so depressed as a child when be reading big girl books meant that you didn't have any pictures anymore. And it was really, really sad. And I really didn't rate it and I was really upset. I was like, why can't you have pictures? Where are the pictures? Good for dyslexic who? God, what else the what else? I swear there's this edition is meant to have pictures in it. Also, a lot of historical editions um, have prints in them, have pictures in them. Excuse me, publishers, can we have the fucking pictures back, dudes? Roxana has pictures in the front. I want the pictures back. Like, why, why, would you, why would you take out the pictures that's part of a fucking historical document? Give me the full fucking paratext. Don't be a pussy. I'm just saying. Also, I really rate publishers who put maps in their editions. Just floating that out there. If any of you are doing a publishing thing, anything, maps, please. And just all of the historical paratexts that should be here in the first fucking place. Um, please and thank you. For example, uh, <laughs> maybe not we're sad, but I know there are fucking prints for Justine, for the orgies, there are for Juliet. Um, don't be wimps, please put, not please put in the orgies, just please put in the etchings that belong with the original editions as they were printed. It just, I did, I will pay two pounds more for it if I have to, if it's the fucking cost of the ink and the books, okay? Like, I will pay for it. Give us decent fucking pictures. Anyway, completely irrelevant rant over. Um, I'm really excited for Orlando. Lots of exploring gender roles. Same with them in Things Fall Apart, exploring gender roles is really interesting. And I'm honestly in Mitford as well because she is again such like just a strong female voice. That is not a woman who takes shit from men, I can tell you that straight up. So yeah, I'm really excited to read this. Just then as more historical viewpoint and then on gender. Orlando changes gender, sex with just no bang of an eyelid. So I'd very much like to explore that then from this historical viewpoint. Mm, if you've read it, tell me how you like it. Uh, but I really fucking rate the film. It's on Amazon Prime. Moving on. Moving on, we have a good little stack of plague literature. Of course we do. Thanks, coronavirus. So I've got the two things that you almost can't go without. I read Daniel Foe's Journal of a Plague Year, as some of you will already know. So continuing on that theme, I've gone for Camus, The Plague, and The Decameron. Did I tell you in a video that I was so sure I had this, but then I didn't? I definitely have it somewhere, but my mother did not rate the translation whatsoever, so her and I did some digging to find a good translation. I'll talk about this first now that I'm waving it at you. So this is Boccaccio, and I always want to say Focaccia, but it's, that's not what it is. And this translation is by Wayne A. Rebhorn. Reborn? Rebhorn. If you're going to read it in English, buy this edition. This is the one that my mum really, really rates. My mother is an academic, so this is a good edition. So the Decameron is many will argue um, what Chaucer ripped off to get the Canterbury Tales. The premise of this is that it's a group of people, I, th I think friends, a group of people who, to escape the plague that's happening in Italy, <laughs> Black Death, they go to the countryside and to pass the time they tell stories, they take turns telling stories, which again, structurally really similar to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. This is why. This is one of those not foundational text, I don't know if that's the right word, but one of those always in print, always read, always studied kind of like works. And it's exciting and each day there are different stories. <laughs> the year of our plague, London 2021. And this one also doesn't have a surplus of notes. There are obviously a decent stack of notes at the back, but some things you almost become fucking impenetrable to read because of how many notes there are and you often I don't know if anyone feels as if I've ever read, um, is it Ulysses or Ulysses? Ulysses. James Joyce. There are editions that have like so many notes that you can't, you can't get into the flow of the story at 
awe because you feel like you stop, you start, you stop, and you start. Um, especially because when you're reading someone's notes, it's someone else's work, it's someone else's voice. So there's like that weird interchopping and flow that is just not, not a vibe. Annoyingly, that is exactly how I felt about reading Alain de Potter. Alain de Botton? Or Alain de Botton? I can't. Ugh. Course of Love, which is why I don't like it at all. I appreciate what it does, what it does, blah, but it's because it's novel philosophy, novel philosophy, novel philosophy. <laughs> it is novel philosophy. But it, it, the flow of the entire novel is interrupted and you would think that you get used to it, but you don't. I found it very stop start. If you have too many notes in something and they're also just not and they're embedded at the bottom rather than at the end, that again feels very stop start and it is incredibly irritating. But this is a good old bit of medieval storytelling. I was gonna say fancy, but like, know how most fantasy seems to be set in the middle ages anyway. I'm excited for this. God only knows when I'll read it. Will I read it and sit down and read it in one go? Probably not. It's 800 pages. Well, it is only 800 pages. Which doesn't seem that bad. How long is The Secret History? Yeah, The Secret History is 600 pages. So suddenly, because I read this, many of you know I read this so fucking quickly. Okay, well, this is considerably bigger. Jesus Christ, so much big hat. Wait, how is this 600 pages and this is 800 pages? That doesn't make it, that doesn't make any sense. But yeah, if you're looking for a bit of plague literature to feel less alone, um, who knows? Maybe if you want to, if you're still stuck in lockdown, maybe this will help you while away the time um, and reading a new story every day. A celebration of the sheer pleasure of being alive. I cannot wait to enjoy just for sheer pleasure of being alive. 10 young Florentines, seven women and three men, flee the black death of 1348 by escaping to the countryside overlooking the city. There they spend 10 days telling each other stories, 100 in all, running the gamut of medieval genres and themes, romance, tragedies, comedies, farces. Their stories overflow with wit, earthliness, and bawdy irreverence. Boccaccio's reputation as one of the world's greatest authors rests entirely on this singular overflowing work. It has been a source of inspiration for countless other storytellers over the centuries. Yeah, and this is meant to be a really fucking good translation. Um, it's a Norton edition. Norton critical editions for when you study things. Excellent, by the way. I really rate them. I don't have many of them because I only use them when I've studied things. Um, I've use Norton editions when I've studied drama. I think they're quite decent for that. Um, vintage I read for pleasure. Um, Penguin classics are good to study from. Oxford World classics are the best to study from. Somebody asked me recently what my favourite editions were. It depends on what you use it for. Um, and then I have my rainbow organised, disjointed shelf up there. My mother tried to initially get me to read this by going like, Emma, it's full of love stories and you'll love it. And it's so, so much love and romance. Emma, it's full of sex. Oh, okay. She knows how to pitch to her audience, apparently. Um, and there's like a titty on the front, so you know it's gonna be juicy. I think this is a very classic, I mean, obviously my comp class would tell you this. This is a classic of Italian literature. Florentine literature, Italian disgust. I'm really excited to just have it as part of my like even collection. I feel like it's one of those like essential things. And if I'm gonna buy it, may as well buy it now. Cries and fucking plague, seriously, dudes. Okay, I bought Camus. You know, I think Camus is a miserable fucking git, but a lot of you rated this, and we are in a plague, so I'm going to read this plague because um, I like to not have to feel super depressed about what happened to us, and it makes me feel better knowing it happened to other people. Um, I made a whole video on this concept. It's over, it's over here. It's over here. We love, we love exacting, extracting, exacting empathy for ourselves from reading novels. This empty town, white with dust, saturated with sea smells, loud with the howl of the wind. The townspeople of Uran are in the grip of a deadly plague, which spread from rats and now condemns its human victims to a swift and horrifying death. Forced into quarant quarantine is the word I never want to hear again. Quarantine in the sweltering heat, heat, each person responds in their own way to the lethal disease. Some resign themselves to fate, some seek balance and revenge, and a few, like the unheroic Dr. Iridu joins forces to defy the terror. Written just after the Nazi occupation of France, the plague is a taut, visceral depiction of resistance against a seemingly uncontrollable evil. Winner of a Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> well, if they said it's good, it must be good, right? I don't like existentialism, and I don't like nihilism. I don't like those kinds of philosophies at all. We, you know that I think Camus is a miserable git. However, 
doesn't mean I don't want to read it. And I generally sometimes think that just because you don't necessarily like someone doesn't mean you shouldn't read their stuff. Because I've said before, like, just because you don't necessarily like it doesn't mean it's not good um, and doesn't mean that you don't necessarily get something out of it. Like, I think you should read things that have... Okay, like isn't the right word, agree with. Um, I like Camus' writing. I think he's an incredible writer. I just don't like him or his opinions, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I shouldn't read his stuff. What else have I read by Camus? I've read... Um, Exile in the Kingdom stories, which is something that I've read from Camus. Um, Camus' Create Dangerously. Um, which is just, again, a collection of like speeches and little essays. Is Camus French Algerian? Yeah, he is, right? Again, continue to decolonialize your bookshelf. Yeah, Camus was born in Algeria in 1913. He studied philosophy at the University of Algiers, then became a journalist. Ooh, he was killed in a road accident in 1960. Interesting. More plague literature, because obviously, you should read things that you find are challenging. If you only read things just for sheer pleasure and enjoyment, you do you. But I think if you ever want to just exp if you ever want to expand your mind, don't just read things that you like or agree with, because you're just feeding the same opinions. You're not generating any new ones. And often it's the best way to know what you do believe is by reading things that make you go, yes, no, I don't believe this. It's a great way to establish boundaries and draw the lines of where your beliefs, morals and opinions actually lie because otherwise you don't necessarily know. Well let's talk about human suffering. I'm excited to see what this can teach me about human suffering, and especially seeing as we are all now poised in a unique position to be able to relate and understand and to an extent, depending on your situation, feel the same. That got sad. Anyway, moving on. These are the two things that you two you message me about this like relentlessly, you lot. You genuinely do. But here's the fucking thing. You guys have taste. And that makes it really difficult for me to be like, mm, I'm not gonna get it. And because I have so little impulse control, I bought these two that you've been telling me to buy. This will shock none of you and indulges a lot of you. I bought, if we were villains, and the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. And I'm really excited about it. I read like the first, like there's an article page in this that starts this off and I read it because I was like, ooh, ooh. And then I got kind of sucked into it and then I was like, I need to not read this right now because I'm still reading a different book. I can't read multiple books at the same time. I'm excited for this. And if we were villains, because you guys know that I fucking loved The Secret History. I loved it so much it was honestly fantastic and i'm so grateful that you guys recommend it to me but also many of you are quite persistent being like emma you're really gonna like it and you are right um and a few of you as far as dark academia as a genre goes rate this one higher so i was like wow with the secret history that's a lot about like classics right that's where it derives its pretension or its power in terms of intellectualisms from classics. This, as far as I'm aware, does it with Shakespeare. I grew up in the UK, I'm educated in this country. I've done a lot of Shakespeare. 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 And it took a lot longer for me to actually enjoy it. Um, I credit Ophelia with actually me enjoying Shakespeare a lot, by the way. Um, I have no idea if she knows that. Um, but she made it not shit. So many of you have sold this to me. The reason I bought this is because many of you were like, it's really similar to Secret History, if not better. There's lots of homoeroticism in it, um, not to fetishize gay men. That's a completely different discussion, obviously, but we like queer stuff on this channel. Of course we fucking do. And also murder. We love a good murder mystery wrapped up in academic because it makes us feel smart and sneaky. Oliver Marks has just served 10 years for a murder he may or may not have committed. On the day of his release, he is greeted by the detective who put him in prison. Detective Colborn is retiring, and he wants to know what really happened a decade before. If you're a detective, isn't, isn't, isn't that your job to find out before someone's in prison for a decade? Anyway, as a young actor at an elite conservatory, conservatoire, conservatory, Oliver notices that his talented classmates seem to 
play the same characters on stage and off villain, hero, temptress, though he is always a supporting role. But when the teachers change the casting, a good-natured rivalry turns ugly and the play is spilled dangerously over into real life. When tragedy strikes, one of the seven friends is found dead. The rest face the greatest acting challenge yet, convincing the police and themselves that they are blameless. <laughs> oh, damn, now I want to read this. Ooh, big font. Ooh, and that was a line from Leah. Lear is something that I've like seen bits of here and there, but I've never actually like sat down and read the entire play. There's a good BBC adaptation of it, actually, um, which I really, really rate. Ooh, we watched, um, fuck, what's it called? Is it ja yeah, it's a Japanese um, adaptation of it. In English, it's just called Ran by um, Kurosawa. That's an adaptation of Lear. I really recommend that. It's long. <laughs> You kind of need to be in a mindset that you want to watch something pretentious before you start watching it um, and be prepared, maybe have a glass, don't have a glass of wine, you may fall asleep, have a cup of coffee, then watch it. As far as like an interesting deep westernized kind of idea, I think it's quite funny to see something like um, a Japanese um, film director adapting Shakespeare. I think we did this in the 19th set. 1970s. An interesting take. I was like, okay, cool, why not? So I really like Leah. Um, I don't like Hamlet. You know, this Hamlet fucking comes up in everything though. So everyone else likes Hamlet. I get it, Goethe, whatever. I don't particularly like it. I like Macbeth. I do like Macbeth. Much of and I think is fine. There's another one that I've completely forgotten the name of. And I haven't watched any of like Anthony and Cleopatra kind of. I haven't watched any of those, like the more classical ones I haven't seen, but I would desperately want to when things open up again. I can't wait, I'm so excited. Anyway. That was a tangent. As somebody who makes films and has worked with actors, I have opinions on actors. So I'm quite excited to read this because actors are quite interesting, funny people. A very special breed, shall we say. There's so many jokes that we make about like the fact of like drama schools and film schools, like there is as much drama going on in the background than there is on screen and on stage. I promise you that. Like we all need somewhere to draw from, right? We're usually drawing quite close to home. I really like Dark Academia as an aesthetic. I kind of think that this outfit is kind of Dark Academia-esque. Also, um, if you think my hair is curly, turns out this is my natural hair. I was not aware of this. I'm trying the like curly girl method because I was like, oh shit, uh, my hair is actually surprisingly curly and wavier than I thought it was. This has taken many attempts. You may have noticed in past videos I was rather frizzy. Because getting the whole like curl, to wave, to frizz, balance right, is really fucking hard. <laughs> and I'm learning. Anyway, I love Dark Academia. I will do a Dark Academia recommendations in terms of books that are, as a genre of Dark Academia and books that feature heavily in Dark Academia. Books that you can read to make you feel like you're living in this. Um, and I will also do movie recs because I have a bunch of really good Dark Academia movie recommendations you would all really enjoy. So I'll do that soon, seeing as you all enjoy my five books that changed my life a lot more than I thought you would. If you have any like book videos you want that aren't just like what I read, what I'm going to read, like these more curated videos, leave them down below because I'm absolutely like game to hear them. Again, because I don't watch book talk, book talk, booktube, I'm booked. I've ended up on book talk, of course I fucking have. We love enemies to lovers tropes. Please leave your recommendations down below. I don't know what kind of content you necessarily want from the book side of this channel. So if you have recommendations and requests, go for it. My TBR is so juicy right now. It is so juicy right now that I'm just sort of looking at everything like I wanna read all of it and I wanna read all of it right fucking now. <coughs> if we were villains, there's no limit to the damage they can do. <laughs> this is by ML Rio. Like Donna Tart's A Secret History, ML Rio's sparkling debut is richly layered story of love, friendship, and obsession. Oh, love a good bit of mania. Obviously, I'm gonna say mania instead of obsession because come on, let's drag the Greeks into this because that's what they all fucking do. Next up, the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Hugo, Hugo, Hugo. We love women who marry and have many lovers. Is this just a Hollywood glamour version of Roxana? I fucking hope so, genuinely. Like I've said about a million times already, I make films um, and I really do love that Hollywood like glamour age, like the Liz Taylors and Audrey Hepburns and Marilyn Monroe's, like we love those as like, we love them as cultural figures of femininity and then also like strength and performance and just like, kind of a more voluptuous beauty with them, um, especially with Liz Taylor and Monroe. And also Elizabeth Taylor, just, oh. 
oh, amazing. This has always come up on like um, Amazon when I've bought stuff where it's like, you would like this. And I'm like, mm. And then you guys were like, you would like this. And I was like, ooh. And I've seen many of you on Goodreads like read this and say we really liked it. So I was like, well, if you all said it was good, maybe I should just read it. I need to just stop being late to the party with all of these books. Um, I was so late with normal people, but also I needed a bit of cajoling, shall we say, to read more contemporary things. But I'm starting, <laughs> I'm starting to trust your taste all a lot more because you do know mine quite well. A spellbinding novel about love, glamour, and the price of fame. Reclusive Hollywood icon Evelyn Hugo is finally ready to tell the truth about her glamorous and scandalous lifestyle. But when she chooses unknown magazine reporter Monique Grant to write her story, no one is more astounded than Monique herself. From making her way to Los Angeles in the 1950s to leaving show business in the 80s, and of course, the seven husbands along the way, Evelyn unspools a tale of ruthless ambition, unexpected friendship, and a great forbidden love. But as Evelyn's story nears its conclusion, it becomes clear that her life intersects with Monique's own in tragic and irreversible ways. <sighs> oh, it's exciting. Oh, it's exciting. Oh, I'm excited to read this. I'm so excited to read this. And I don't hate this font. I quite enjoyed this font, actually. This is a font I like. I like this. Ooh, the decameron font. I quite like this as well which you literally can't see as I'm doing that at all. Specific about font. I'm weirdly specific about fonts, um, so I quite rate this. Yeah, many of you have told me to read this, so I was like, all right, why not? Many of you told me to read this, so I was like, all right, why not? Genre-wise, don't really know what to say about this one, um, except that it's kind of going a little bit more further afield than what I usually read, but then again, um, as many of you know, the only things I ever want to make movies about, for example, are women, sex, and power. So I kind of feel like that fits this triad. So we'll see. That is all of them. I acquired those with quite a rapid speed. And there we have it. That is everything that I have bought recently. Any recommendations power for things I should read, leave them down below. Any requests for videos you would like, also leave those down below. Um, I'm always very keen and eager to hear them. But yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very, very much for watching. Like, subscribe, and all the jazz. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Bye. <laughs>